Hi folks, Rob Flux here from Property Developer Network coming to you for another Sunday session. Uh, today's topic is a little bit uh, off centre from property side of things, but there is a slight property twist to it towards the end. The topic is bankruptcy law changes and the impending changes that are actually coming uh, as announced by Josh Frydenberg uh, as of Thursday this week. Uh, and the intention is to actually stave off the economic collapse uh, that uh, I guess is potentially impending given the fact that we are in the worst recession since the Great Depression. Now that said, uh, let's get into the topic a little bit. So I guess there are thousands of companies right now that are, I guess, have temporarily been able to fend off insolvency and liquidation under some temporary uh, uh, under some temporary insolvency and liquidation laws that came into effect in March last year. They've been extended to about December 31st in that temporary measure. Uh, however, there's a number of questions that are sitting in and around, uh, I guess, the economy about how many of those businesses are actually going to collapse, okay? Now, the changes that were announced by Josh Frydenberg this week uh, are the largest changes to insolvency laws in the last 30 odd years and will have a massive impact uh, on the ability to, for businesses to actually try and trade out of some challenging times that they're in right now in and around these uh, COVID times and, and the implications that have happened around that. So the intention is that it's going to apply to any businesses where they've got a liability of less than $1 million, okay? Uh, so that's about 76% 76, 76 of all small businesses who are currently going through the insolvency process. And I'll go through those numbers uh, in a bit. Uh, but there are 98% of these businesses that have less than 20 employees. So there's a large implication on, I guess, the, I guess the very small businesses that you know, the coffee shops, the, the small restaurants, uh, and I guess the sole operators, a number of people like that, uh, that uh, have been unable to work for a variety of reasons during COVID with a number of lockdowns going down. Uh, and in particular in Victoria, where they've had to go through two different lockdowns uh, at the same time. So these changes are going to affect millions and millions of employees uh, as, as a, and obviously as a byproduct of their employers being able to stay in business. Uh, but the number of employees currently that are going through JobKeeper and JobSeeker and a number of things like that, uh, all of these laws are actually all intertwined. And so there's, I guess, a, a number of things that they need to actually have a look at uh, in doing this. So this overhaul, this overhaul it comes, uh, I guess, against dire predictions of the fact that we're going to have a wave of small businesses actually go under. And I've got some stats from the Australian Bureau of Statistics that sit in around that. Once things like the COVID support packages start to die off, and there are a number of those support packages. So there's been moratoriums on, uh, on mortgages. There's been moratoriums on evictions. There's the job keeper and the job seeker. Uh, all of these things are starting to, to wane out. Uh, and so what the, uh, the government is trying to do is to say, well, what can we do to prop up these businesses, keep them afloat for as long as humanly possible, and uh, I guess keep them trading and let, allow them to actually trade out of, uh, out of debt where in many other instances and in, under the previous laws, they would actually have been forced into the insolvency process and assets uh, frozen and or sold. Um, now, why is this the case and why is this really important? Well, let's just have a look at some of our unemployment rates. So you see unemployment shot up massively uh, and has, has come off uh, quite a little bit, but they're anticipating another spike in that, uh, given that these aren't the latest. They were the latest released this month, but there's about a six week delay in the announcements of these and obviously Victoria being locked down uh, still. So we're at approximately 6.8% unemployment at this moment in time. Uh, and if we then take a, an extended look at this, not only have we got unemployment, but we've also got underemployment. So the underemployment is currently sitting at 11.8%. Uh, and un, I guess there is also a thing called the underutilization rate where people are employed, but they're not employed to their full capacity. And that's sitting in around the 18% mark. When we have a look at all of those things, the reason for that is that businesses aren't able to trade at the moment. Uh, and as they're not able to trade, they're not able to generate income. As they're not able to generate income, they're accumulating more and more debt. 
Now, all of these people, that these, st these stats for the unemployment and underemployment are being propped up by the JobKeeper packages. And with those JobKeeper packages uh, about to wane off, uh, that's where uh, I guess everybody is really concerned about the, the long-term implications. So let's just have a look at uh, the job keeper and job seeker situations as to where they are right now uh, and where they're actually heading. So if we have a look at job keeper, there's currently uh, $1,500 per fortnight on job keeper. That's about to end at the end of September and be cut down by about $300 a fortnight down to 1,200. Uh, and then that's going to uh, drip feed down a little bit further. Uh, at the end of December, that's going to drop another $200 down to uh, $1,000 per fortnight. Uh, and that's scheduled to cease altogether uh, in March sometime. Uh, on a similar vein, Job, uh, job Seeker, um, currently $1,100 per fortnight. That includes a $550 coronavirus supplement. Uh, that supplement is about to be cut by $300 uh, at the end of September, which is only a couple of days away. Uh, and that's going to go down to $800 being only $250 coronavirus supplement. Uh, and then that's scheduled to end at the end of September where everybody then has to start looking for jobs and a number of things like that. So it gets really, really bleak. And a result of that, the Australian Bureau of Statistics have actually gone out and said, well, how many businesses are actually uh, in financial difficulty right now? And uh, whilst they only uh, interviewed a subset of businesses, uh, what they found is over a third of businesses are actually impacted at the moment, uh, at, or a third of small business, I should say. So 35% of small business is in severe financial difficulties uh, with 18% of large business. Uh, so this survey was conducted, um, I guess, for... Uh, between the 12th and the 19th of August. Uh, and I guess it was to a limited subset of people. But uh, I guess if we extrapolate this out, it has some dire consequences in our economy, which is why the, the government is trying to prop this up right now. Uh, the challenge there, not only uh, are businesses struggling to stay afloat, but it means that they can't actually spend money on investments and actually uh, spend money on actually improving the business and business productivity and things like that. They're just struggling to keep the lights on. Uh, and with no business investment, that means that, that I guess the, the accumulative effect of that, where people are spending money in other people's businesses as they buy assets and infrastructure and things like that, uh, tends to slow down. And so it has this daisy chain effect of multiple businesses potentially going to, to uh, take each other out. Uh, and I guess that also is impacted by uh, I guess consumer demand and things like that, which at the moment is at a fairly low uh, uh, point in the in the cycle. And so when we have a look at you know what is deemed to be a small business, so small businesses are uh, between zero and nineteen employees, medium businesses between twenty and one hundred and ninety nine, and a large business is two hundred business uh, and over, according to the Australian Bureau of Steer. Australian Bureau of Statistics. Uh, so uh, now that said, I guess, what is the formal definition of a small business? Well, there's actually a couple of different formal definitions depending upon which uh, particular organisation is actually measuring this. So ASIC has a definition uh, where you have to meet at least two of the three criteria that are listed there. So an annual revenue of less than $50 million, uh, less than 100 employees uh, at the end of any one financial year, uh, or a consolidated gross assets of less than 25 million. Now that is a recently updated uh, definition that changed uh, approximately a year ago. It was uh, somewhat smaller, the annual revenue turnover, um, but it's anticipated that that ASIC definition is the one that will actually be used. Um, there is an alternative definition for a small business, which is uh, defined by the Australian Taxation Office. Uh, and so they, they deem that to be if it's $10 million aggregated turnover, uh, et cetera. So um, my anticipation is that it's going to be the ASIC definition that's actually defined, uh, but that's uh, yet to be determined. Let's have a look at, the, I guess, the business size by employment. This is from a, 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 a recent uh, Australian Bureau of Statistics, um, we're talking about 2.25 million businesses that are between zero and 19 people employed. That's 97.7% of all businesses out there are in that small, uh, I guess, small bracket. 
Uh, and if we go by the, the extrapolation of that, 35% of them are in financial difficulty, uh, that could be some really, really dire consequences. Now, I don't think it's going to actually eventuate that all of those people will actually start to go into liquidation because of, of the, both the temporary uh, measures that have been put in place and also the proposed uh, amendments that are actually coming through right now. But if we have a look at, I guess, a little bit more of a deeper breakdown of this, uh, if we have a look at how many people are solo employed, self-employed, 1.2 million businesses only have one employee. Um, uh, if we look at a micro business, which is one to four employees, is 584,000. And if we look at, uh, I guess, I, I guess a slightly larger or a small business between five and 19 employees, we got 197. So all in all, when we start to look at that, um, there's a massive number of businesses that are 19, uh, 19 employees and below. And as I said, 97.7% of all business within Australia falls into that category. What that typically means is turnovers for those businesses are quite small uh, and have implications to, I guess, the number, number of employees that they employ and they in turn go and spend money at other small businesses. Uh, so if we look at the turnover, uh, less than 50,000, there are 541,000 people in that category. There are between 50K and 200K, there's 730 odd uh, businesses that fall into that category. Uh, and as we go up between 200K and 2 million, we've got 707 odd thousand uh, people that fall into that category. So there's not a huge number of businesses. And so the proposed changes that they're talking about by Josh Frydenberg to keep it under a million, uh, you'll see very much fits, I guess, here and below with the number of businesses that are actually going to be uh, benefited from this process. Uh, and and I'll walk to what some of the what they're actually proposing here uh, in two seconds time. So I guess what are the key elements of the reform? Well, effectively, they want to introduce, I guess, a new restructuring process uh, for businesses where their liability is less than a million dollars. Now, if we look back at, if I just go back one slide with regards to uh, the income, well, the, when we look at the income, the majority of these businesses don't even have an income of a million dollars a year. So when we start to look at this from a liabilities perspective of a million dollars, a million dollars is a massive amount of money by comparison to the revenue that they actually generate. So uh, what they're proposing is any business with a liability less than a million dollars, uh, they're going to, um, uh, I guess, try and allow them to trade out of the debt. Now, how are they allowing them to do this? Well, they've actually gone and copied uh, I guess some legislation over in the US, not 100% copied, but they've taken all of the best elements uh, out of what is called chapter 11 uh, in the, the US um, business model, uh, which allows them to be a little bit more flexible in how uh, I guess people are actually dealt with. And in particular, they're moving away from the creditor in possession. So the person owed the money taking possession of the business and more going to be a bit more of a flexible model where the debtor, the person who owes the money is actually in possession of the business. This allows eligible businesses to allow to restructure existing debts while remaining in control of their business. Uh, by being in control, they know, I guess, how to, to generate the revenue best, whereas uh, liquidators typically gonna come in uh, and just uh, dissolve the assets. Um, so that's the first step in the process is allowing the business owner to actually trade the business, which is very different to uh, the current process. If and when that business gets into, uh, into trouble, I guess this is the process that's going to happen. So firstly, there's going to be a flat fee to call in any advisors to allow them to, to trade out of this. Uh, and the process will be that you have 20 business days to develop a restructuring plan uh, by that small business restructuring practitioner. Um, once you have that plan in place, uh, you then go out to your creditors and you have 15 days for the creditors to then vote to see whether or not that plan actually uh, is a, an acceptable plan for them to allow you to do that. Now, if that is, then you can continue to trade uh, because you've defined the rules under which you're going to trade. Uh, if it's not, uh, if the creditors vote against that, which is quite possible, uh, but if they do, then and only then will the liquidation process then start to take place. So liquidation process, when it takes, takes place, 
uh, is then going to be simplified even further. So there's going to be waiving of fees uh, with regards to registering a liquidator. And also there's going to be some reduction in the investigative requirements and reporting for the liquidators. So effectively the fees and charges that the liquidator charges to wind the business up means that there's going to be less uh, charges, which means that there's actually more uh, assets left in the business to go towards the, uh, the creditors. Uh, and lastly, they're going to cut red tape, uh, I guess for the insolvency in and around that sector. So what does this all mean for the property market? Well, what it really means, what it really means is that there's uh, a number of changes that are going to come. I guess COVID has introduced so many changes of late uh, and the property market has been holding up steadily, but having little minor dips. Uh, and it's been quite surprising, uh, I guess, how little in, it's actually been impacted by what the original predictions were. Some market economists were predicting anywhere up to 40% changes uh, or, or drops in value uh, for properties. Now, most of those economists have actually revised those uh, market conditions, but that said, they are still predicting drops in the property market, uh, specifically uh, Brisbane and Sydney and more predominantly in Melbourne. Melbourne, they're thinking is gonna take quite a reasonable hit over the next six to 12 months. Uh, before then starting a fairly strong recovery in 12 to 18 months time. Uh, because underlying, we've got some fairly strong fundamentals that sit below us um, that are, I guess, keeping the property market afloat. Uh, but the, I guess, the implications of unemployment being so high and businesses struggling with lockdown, uh, not being able to pay their debts, that sort of thing, means that we've got some really challenging uh, situations where some people, unfortunately, are going to be forced to actually sell. Now, because of all these changes, uh, I, uh, I've put together a special event, which I'm gonna pre-announce right now. It's called the New Rules of Property Development. This is gonna be a virtual event that's gonna be held on Sunday, the 11th of October. It's gonna go for four hours. Um, and basically what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try and do a little bit of a wrap up with all the changes that have been happening in the market in the last eight or nine months or so. Uh, and where I think that's going to cause, I guess, uh, changes to how we're going to have to, to navigate the property market, how to negotiate a little bit differently. So there's been implications from COVID, changes to job seeker, changes to job keeper, unemployments are at record highs. We've had mortgage moratoriums that uh, have kept people afloat that are coming to an end. We've had rent moratoriums that uh, have been stopping tenants from being evicted that are then also coming to an end. Uh, there's these changes to bankruptcy law and uh, as of uh, Friday, there were also some uh, uh, announcements with regards to changes to responsible lending laws. Uh, so all of this stuff means that the way that we borrow money, the way that we're going to purchase properties, uh, whether or not the, the banks are actually going to consider us uh, as a good debt or a bad debt, how they're actually going to assess our loan applications, all those things mean that the way we're going to have to navigate our property investing and property developing is going to be very, very different. Uh, so I'm working on this very special half day event. Uh, it is not formally announced until Tuesday this week. We're just putting some technical things behind the scenes with regards to, uh, I guess, how we're going to get you to RSVP and things like that. So watch this space, folks. We will be announcing that um, on our Facebook page and inside our Facebook groups. Uh, and also if you're uh, part of our community, we will actually be emailing that out to you. So make sure that you uh, stay tuned for that event um, and definitely RSVP. We, we uh, are gonna have some fairly limited spaces. Last time I ran an event like this, uh, we had over 250 people attend that. So uh, I'm anticipating, uh, I guess, that sort of number and potentially even higher for this next one. So make sure that you do RSVP very soon uh, once we actually announce that. Now, uh, I guess while we're talking about announcements, the best place to actually keep track of that is actually go to my Facebook page. Uh, so facebook.com forward slash property developer network. Uh, and a reminder that when you like that page, then you'll get announced uh, every time we do these Sunday sessions, uh, which we do 90% of the time on Sunday afternoon at uh, 5 p.m. Brisbane time, which obviously changes around the country subject to time zones and or uh, whether or not we're in daylight saving. Um, if you want to join us, uh, make sure that you actually like that page and you'll get those alerts. 
Uh, also a little reminder that we have a Facebook community, uh, the Property Developer Network group, uh, and we also have our sister group, which is Development Site Deal Hub, where you can get, uh, I guess, notifications on off-market deals. Uh, it's a place for you to offload off-market deals. And further to that, it's also a great place to seek investors for any of the deals that you might be doing. Now, today was a little bit short and sharp. Uh, what I'm going to do now is see if I can uh, just jump over to Facebook and see if I can get uh, a list of questions with people that are coming through. Uh, now, Facebook today, in its infinite wisdom, has decided to change uh, all of its interface. So uh, it might take me a minute or so, folks, until I can actually see all of your questions coming through. If you can just be a little bit patient, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, okay, here, here we go. I can see them all now. So a lot of people saying, hey, I'm in. Awesome. Uh, a lot of people saying hello. Hello, everybody. So I can say hello to uh, Harry, Sean, Luke, uh, Peter, Jeff, uh, and a number of more. So first question uh, comes from Kay Wong. So Kay Wong saying, Rob, are you sure Melbourne prices will go down? Real estate, this real estate agent uh, told me not to come uh, to inspection if I didn't have a pre-approval. So snobbish. Uh, and the property is the unit in the south of Melbourne. Mate, uh, Melbourne undoubtedly will be dropping, mate. Uh, the question will be how much uh, and how soon. Uh, unfortunately, you guys have been impacted the most with the second lockdown and quite hard. And whilst there's some announcements on the relaxations today, um, I guess the, many of the small businesses that we were just talking about uh, a couple of, couple of moments ago, uh, they're massively impacted in Melbourne, which means that more and more people going to, to uh, unemployment side of things. So uh, this is going to be, um, I guess, a very challenging time in around the Melbourne market, mate. So uh, I would say very definitely watch this space. Uh, Jane says, hey, Rob, how is this differing from earlier in the season? Uh, not sure what you mean by earlier in the season, Jane, but uh, this is effectively a I guess a follow on from an event I did about four months ago called Perfect Storm. So Perfect Storm was talking about, uh, I guess, the fact that COVID was hitting us and the implications of this. Now that COVID has hit, some of the ramifications have been there. The government's put all the incentives in place, all the infrastructure spends and uh, the job keepers and the job seekers, all that sort of stuff. Uh, this is really, I guess, a follow on from that to say, well, what are the, what are the longer term ramifications of that now that we've got a little bit more runway and we can see exactly what's going on. So uh, hopefully that gives you some insights on that. Uh, John's got a question. Any hints on checking the financial stability of builders before committing to a contract? That's a great question, John. Um, the best thing that I can suggest there is that you need to, to go to your relevant building authority in each state um, they, and check on the builder's license. Uh, in mo most states, they actually have a requirement to report on any infringements and also the financial viability of the, of the company at that point in time. Uh, where it gets really challenging, though, is that uh, what you're really seeing is as of the last financial year. Uh, and so it doesn't really give an insight into what's happening right now. Because of that, you should always make sure that you've got the appropriate special conditions in place to have what is called a tripartite agreement where yourself, the bank and the builder, uh, if any th any one of the three go out of business, uh, then the other two have the ability to just take over the project, bring in a third party and kick on with that. Uh, so make sure in doing that, that you've got special conditions in your building contract that allows you to get all of your, uh, I guess, sign off certificates for your slabs and your frames and all that sort of thing. Uh, as and when you're going through the business and you're not trying to claim that at the very, very end. Uh, okay, hopefully that helps. So Luke's got a question. Do you think um, without uh, owning a crystal ball, of course, that government may relax loan applications due to COVID to help Australians own their own house? So Luke, there are changes to the responsible lending that have been announced this week. Uh, they are likely to come into effect in March next year. Uh, I guess there's not a lot of clarity at this point in time on exactly what is going to be covered on that. Uh, but what they are doing is they're moving the liability of the loan onto the lender, sorry, onto the borrower, not the lender. So in the past, the lender had a lot of responsibility to prove that you had a capability of actually paying the loan. Now they're actually turning that around and saying, well, actually, 
you as the applicant for the loan uh, need to demonstrate that you actually have that uh, and uh, and the onus is on you if you I tell porky pies and don't quite tell the truth. And uh, so if the loan goes into default, um, you're more responsible than the bank is. Um, so watch this space, mate. It's early days on that one. Um, hoping to hear a little bit more about that in the next week or so. Uh, and then by the time we run that event on the 11th, I uh, should be able to give you some better insights on that. Uh, Harry's saying, I'm investing and buying excited. Absolutely, mate. There are opportunities galore coming out of the market at the moment. Uh, and even more to come. Now, I'm not talking about preying on people who are in financial difficulty, but if you can find win-win solutions uh, with people who might be uh, financially challenged, uh, you get the flexibility of time uh, and uh, I guess the ability to negotiate terms if you can actually help them out of their financial challenges. Uh, so right now is fantastic uh, buying opportunities. There's not many uh, properties on the market at the moment. I guess the number of people that have listed properties have dropped significantly, uh, but there are people very definitely proactively selling uh, before the bank starts to come in and start tapping on their door. Uh, Jane says, uh, why do you say that amongst others, uh, Brisbane will be quite impacted as far as prices are concerned? Uh, Jane, I guess across the country, um, property is going to be impacted, but it's really, uh, Sydney and Melbourne have had the, the biggest COVID impact uh, and uh, Queensland is, has then had the, I guess, the biggest impact from the borders being locked down. So it's really, uh, I'm going to say Melbourne, then Sydney, then Brisbane have had the biggest implications with regards to industry being impacted by shutdowns. So that's why we're saying that now. I think we're going to be somewhat sheltered here in Brisbane, uh, but, uh, you know, depending upon which economist you're talking to, uh, they're talking between 5 and 10% drop in the market uh, and then a recovery in uh, 12 to 18 months time is what most people are actually predicting. Um, so very early days uh, on that one, but uh, that I would tend to think that most of that would be, uh, would be fairly accurate. Uh, Harry's saying not much stock available in Melbourne. No, mate, there's not much stock anywhere. People are only selling if they really have to at this point in time because there's not enough people that have actually got money. If you don't have a job, the ability to purchase becomes very, very difficult. So, uh, you know, people are tending to hold on to stock at the moment uh, and only sell where absolutely necessary. So you can you can bet your bottom dollar that the ones that are actually going on the market, uh, they're probably in a position where they have to sell, not that they just want to sell. So uh, watch this space. Uh, Amy says prices will go down in Melbourne, but loans are much harder to obtain these days. So not surprising that vendors and agents are being cautious. They are much harder to obtain despite very low interest rates, Amy, um, again, which is why the, uh, I guess the, the changes to uh, the lending laws are going to be coming through. Now they won't hit until March. So there's you know quite a bit of lag between now and March. Uh, but uh, I guess the responsible lending laws that are going to come in, I think will make things a little bit easier to actually obtain loans. Now, I don't think it's going to impact the big four banks too much. They, I think they're going to be uh, uh, sticking to their guns with regards to how much that they uh, measure against us with regards to our borrowing capacity. But the smaller, the smaller banks and the smaller lenders, I think are going to get a lot more flexible, a lot more nimble in the kind of products that they're actually offering uh, so watch this space with product offerings that are going to come out. Uh, Kay Wong says, hi, Rob. So you, uh, so you are thinking that the price is going down is yet to come because I've been watching some Melbourne prices. The average rolling 12 month prices have gone up in the last few days. Although I must say the stock market has diminished, especially since the, the so I'm not talking about stock market. Oh, sorry, the stock on market. Uh, so rolling average is a really tricky one, mate. Um, uh, but if you, I guess largely over the over the last little while, it has been steady. But what they're predicting is that the drops are going to come. So uh, both CBA and Westpac have reviewed uh, revised what their original predictions were for market drops. So they were predicting uh, anywhere between uh, twenty and forty percent drop in the market. Uh, if you go back six months, uh, they've all revised their price drops, and the majority of them are predicting that Melbourne is going to drop between 5 and 10%. Uh, 
uh, and the rest of Australia is is probably going to be around that five percent mark. So um, I'd encourage you to go look at what some of the economists are saying that have got a little bit more insights into a lot of the raw data that that uh, that I've got at this very moment in time, mate. Uh, so Harry says I've got money and almost zero stock in Melbourne. Uh, well done, mate. Um, so John Butler saying thanks, uh, Rob. Awesome info, rebuild a stability. Uh, that no problems at all. Lynn says, uh, I don't want to underplay it, but when you look at the actual net profit per year on many small businesses, they are running out of uh, running on a shoestring. Absolutely, that that's kind of the point. Meaning, COVID or not, they would struggle medium term. That's just my observation, uh, and I would absolutely 100% uh, concur with that when you look at those numbers. Uh, so, you know, when, if you're talking about businesses with a debt of a million dollars and their turnover is not even a million, it's going to take them a long time to trade out of that. Uh, so it's going to have to be a very, um, I guess, a very uh, robust uh, lender or, or, or creditor that's actually going to give them the runway to actually do that and, and be patient enough to wait for their money. Uh, Luke's got a question. Uh, are people on government benefits behind, um, behind on the right ball of trying to get a loan for a property uh, for later sale or personal ownership now or in the future. Um, if you're on government benefits, I think the ability to borrow for a, for a home loan, I think is going to be challenging, uh, Luke. So I'm not quite sure uh, your, your reference point there, but if you're on JobKeeper or JobSeeker, um, I think you might struggle at this moment in time with being able to borrow. Uh, and even if you could borrow, I'd be cautious to say, if you're in that financial uh, circumstance where you know that you're on a knife's edge, I don't know that I'd want to be putting myself in a position to actually add to that. Um, Cameron has got a question. Hi, Rob. What's your view on the removal evictions moratorium impact on the rental market? Uh, that's a good question, Carmen. Um, I'm going to say the the challenge has been with the, the evictions moratorium is that uh, tenants have been able to not pay, which means that the landlords are then forced into a situation where they have no ability to pay the loan. So they, the landlord has then had to have this knock-on effect with them asking for a, a loan moratorium as well. Uh, and so the ability to evict people means that they should be able to get somebody in who is able to pay the rent. Having said that, the amount of stock on market is going to mean uh, that I think that rental prices will go down. They've, they've already gone down a long way. Uh, and I think they'll go uh, down, uh, I guess, a reasonable amount again further until such time as uh, people actually have enough uh, capacity to actually start to pay rent. So if you've got people, not enough people with the ability to pay rent, uh, then you're not going to have enough qualified renters, which means that you're going to have to start to lower your price point to actually get the renters into the market that you can actually find. Uh, Julie's got a question. Supply is currently an issue in Melbourne. Five agents I spoke to last week are all achieving higher prices than pre-COVID. They were all expecting drop in prices before COVID. COVID hit, but demand is now exceeding supply. It will be interesting when restrictions lift and supply increases. Well, that's a supply and demand type scenario where I guess because there's limited supply, then the few people who are actually qualified, um, I guess, can afford to pay that little bit more. But I don't think that you would have seen massive increases in prices. Uh, and if you, and I would say that's only in pockets. Um, I'd have to see exactly where you're talking about, Julie, but overall the trend uh, has been trickling down uh, and they're expecting that trickle to, to increase a little bit further to uh, uh, let's just say a fast stream. Um, K Wong says, that's great to know. Thanks, mate. I actually really wonder if prices will drop, especially in the inner city. Um, yeah, keep an eye on the markets. Look at the trends. I, what some of my previous Sunday sessions, I've given you some indications of trends when you look at supply and demand and the, the number of the amount of stock on market. Um, go look up a gentleman by the name of John Lindemann. Uh, John has some really good articles on how to actually start to predict. Uh, when markets are starting to turn. So uh, keep an eye on that. Uh, John says, is the next 12 months a time uh, for doing quick flippers uh, with off market finance rather than large deals with longer timeframes? John, I'm gonna say the next 12 months uh, and, and hence why my, um, uh, I guess the, that half day session I'm gonna do 
uh, is it's going to have to be very creative in how we how we actually uh, come up with and acquire property, uh, and also because the the market is moving so quickly at the moment uh, and changes are happening afoot, then short term projects definitely have a um, uh, I guess a benefit. However, um, all the predictions are that the market's going to rise in twelve to eighteen months time. So that said the longer term projects may actually be a little bit stronger because by that time we'll have opened the international borders. International borders means that we've got more demand coming into the area. Uh, so the, the likelihood of our, our the larger projects actually picking up in the longer term, it, I think is actually higher. Uh, whereas the short term projects might be a little bit more volatile. Um, uh, Harry says, Rob, in which city should we invest? Uh, Harry, I'm not gonna fall for that trick, mate. Uh, I guess uh, I know that you're part of my program, but I'm not going to uh, announce that stuff to the world. Um, the best guidance I can actually give you is become an area expert uh, and generally area expert in the local area in which you are logistically, geographically convenient. Um, that would be uh, something where you can actually then go and uh, investigate your projects and run your projects. Now, noting um, you said invest, uh, and I'm talking about develop, okay? Uh, I guess I am a property developer and I keep my stock uh, as my investment. Um, I don't go and buy long-term buy and hold anymore. Uh, I did that for 20 odd years and I've now learned the error of my ways. Uh, and so now I'm a uh, fully fledged property developer. Uh, Leo says, how soon will the changes in responsible lending uh, changes take? Uh, I'm on capital gains income only. Uh, Leo, they're, they're talking about uh, that coming into force in March next year. Um, I'm gonna say the next month or so will give you, I guess, the full details on what's gonna come in that then has to be voted on uh, in order to actually be approved. Uh, but it would be very difficult for the opposition to actually um, uh, say no to those because it really is something that's gonna be stimulating our economy. Uh, Luke says, thanks for your time and answering people's questions. You're no problem at all, mate. Uh, and uh, Harry's replying to Leo, so I'll leave that in place. Tamara says, uh, are there any insolvency restructuring laws that apply to those small businesses with 1 million plus debt? I'm not aware, Tamara, um, uh, it, I guess with the 1 million plus, I don't think that they're proposing to change that. It's really the 1 million below debt. Um, I'm hoping that you're not one of those people in that 1 million plus debt category. Um, uh, so I'm hoping it's just a, a, a generic question because uh, that's a very tricky place to actually be. So, um, but to the best of my knowledge, there is no changes to anything with the million dollars plus debt. Um, and that would be maintaining the existing structure. So that said, folks, uh, we're coming up close to the hour and doesn't look like there's any more questions coming through. So I'm going to leave it at that. Uh, but what I would say is just a reminder that we will be doing that upcoming event uh, that is, uh, I guess, the, uh, the new rules on property development. We're going to talk about uh, the implications of all of these changes, whether they be uh, the, uh, I guess, the changes to, to what's happening in around COVID, whether it's the changes to the, the lending criteria, whether it's the, uh, I guess, the changes to the bankruptcy laws, uh, changes to evictions, all of that stuff, it's all snowballing together and it's got a bit of a mixed bag. So I'm going to do that uh, virtual event Sunday, the 11th of October between 9am and 1pm. Uh, watch this space, we'll send the alerts out for that on Tuesday. Uh, so please make sure you RSVP early because our spaces will be limited. So there you go, folks. Thank you very much for uh, your attendance today. Uh, it's been great once again, and we will see you again next week uh, on our next one. Bye for now.